this is this is where we left off, right? We were talking about if we had a node class, but it was like a binary node where it had two children, a left and a right, and some data. Suddenly, we can easily make these binary trees, a link structure of them. Now, we're not going to implement a linked binary tree. We're going to implement a linked binary search tree, which is, I believe is the next topic. But there's going to be algorithms and code that's going to be very specific to the linked binary search tree. But there's going to be some that would be relevant for any binary tree, more generally speaking. So we could talk about some of those things. So imagine, well, look, if I'm making a binary, a linked binary search tree implementation, I'm going to want a size field, right? Just like your bag implementation, just like your queue, just like your stack. You had a field that was just an integer and it held on to the size. But imagine for a second that I gave you an implementation, but there was no size field, and you weren't allowed to have a size field. And I were to say, I want you to tell me how big this binary tree is. Now, if this was just a regular old link structure, all you have to do is you start at the beginning, you go to the next one, and then the next one, and every time you look at something, until you get to the end, you just add one, right? But with a binary tree, it's a little different, because, well, uh, how do you traverse it? Well, really, it doesn't really matter. If we do a pre, in, or post, this I suppose would be more analogous to like a pre traversal. But we could easily count the number of nodes in a binary tree. Like, look, if I were to do this recursively with a regular old link structure, we, I could play that, that lazy game, that recursive lazy game of just saying, okay, assuming the node exists, the length of that link structure is the length is, is one plus the length of everything after the head, right? And then you go, well, what's the size of everything after the head? Well, that's where recursion comes in. You just ask the exact same question of the next node. With a binary tree, it's the same idea. You ask the root, how big is this tree? And you go like, well, it's one plus however big the left subtree is plus however big the right subtree is. So here there's two recursive calls for each of the subtrees. But that's all the algorithm is. It's one for the node, plus however many is over here, and however many is over here. Add that together, that's the size. That's it. But again, you say, well, how do you know the size of the left and right subtree? It feels like you're skipping a step. Well, that's where recursion comes in. You just ask the root of the left subtree, how many nodes are there there? When it goes, like, well, one plus however many there are in its left subtree, and its right subtree, and so on. So to look at the code, I'm going to have two versions of the algorithm here, or two versions of the size method. One's private, presumably this is in a class, right, for this linked binary search tree. And let's look at the, no, the, the private one. That's the recursive one. It checks, well, OK, is current null? If it's null, its size is 0. Right? So, <coughs> there. If otherwise, assuming it exists then, because if it, we just checked if it exists or not, if it doesn't exist, you return zero, the size of that tree is zero. Otherwise, it's one plus the size of the left and right subtree. Now, consider, if I just simply draw, I mean, this might help wrap your head around it. Look, if the node doesn't exist, it's, it's zero, right? There's nothing there. Now, if I have a node, garbage. That's slightly better. I'll just represent the left and right subtree as just as triangles. I don't know how big they are. Imagine they're null, though. Imagine there's actually nothing here. Well, I ask this node. It's 1 plus the size of this left subtree. If this left subtree's current is null, if the root of the left subtree is null, 
size is zero. So it's zero plus what plus however big this one is. So it doesn't, you just gotta make sure where the null's coming up. Is the current thing null or is the root of the subtree null? Or, doesn't really matter, it's caught in the base case. Because currents get left might be null. So we go into the recursive call and then, well, current's null, return zero. Now, you might be wondering, why do we have this public one? And then we have this private one. The private one takes the no current, and the public one doesn't. But you consider, imagine, think of like the interface for this class, size. I just want to be able to ask a tree what its size is. I don't want to have to specify and start counting at the root. What this one does, the public one, simply calls the private one, but starts the search at the root node. Because I don't want to have to specify start at the root when I call size on some data structure. But then internally, well, the private size needs to know what the current node is, where to start, and where to start the recursion at. This pattern, very common. If we go back to the, the searching topic, we saw kind of examples of this where, like binary search, when you call it the first time, you want to call it with specific parameters. Or we could just have a, like, a version of the algorithm that didn't have the specific parameters, that just called it with those hard-coded parameters. For like the initial setup one. You'll see a lot of examples of this, so it will click probably. Very common pattern. A public one that doesn't really have any parameters, and then the private one that gets called by the public one with the initial setup parameter to tell it where to start. So what's the computational complexity? Again, if you're thinking, well, there's two recursive calls. I know that when I had two recursive calls, like in Fibonacci, it was two to the n. But here, we gotta be careful about what n is. We're not talking about the height we're talking about the total number of nodes. And if I want to count each one, I've got to put my finger on each of the n nodes, so I've got to put my finger on n nodes. If I double the size of n, I double the amount of things I need to put my finger on. If I double the height of the tree, it's an entirely different story. That grows way faster. Now contains. Given some arbitrary binary tree, how would I search for something? Well, if we go back to the linear search, the recursive linear search on a linear collection, imagine just a link structure, you start it at the beginning. And you say, are you, what you're, are you what we're looking for, yes or no? If you are, you're done. If not, you recursively call it on the subsequent node. And the base case will be whether you either you found it or you got to the end and you never found it. So there's two base cases there. It's the same idea here, just we have a left and a right. You check by saying, okay, is the root node of this tree, subtree, what I'm looking for? If it is, we're done. If it doesn't exist, well, it's not there. And if, it, if it's not what we're looking for, well, we just call the search on the left subtree and on the right subtree, because it could be in either, right? Look at the code. Again, this has that setup thing where you start by checking the needle, but then the pri private one has the current node for recursion. So if current's null, it's not there. Otherwise, if the object in the current node is equal to the needle, return true. Otherwise, return contains left or contains right. So what does this mean? Well. It's not null, current's not null, so it exists, but it doesn't have what I'm looking for, and it has a left and a right child. That could be null, doesn't matter right now. Just do a search over here, and search over here. Now it's or. So if I do a search over here, and it returns true, and a search over here and it returns false, well I know I found it in this subtree, 
But true or false is true, so the falses don't really impact it. Now, do note that this is also the short-circuited OR, meaning if I find it in the left subtree, there's no need to keep searching the right subtree. But that's the idea. That's it. It's the same as the linear search, but instead of just calling it on the successor, you call it on both successors, the two children, the left and the right. Ask the root, do you contain this thing? Yes or no? Okay, ask your left and right subchildren the same question. And do that recursively until you've exhausted all options. Any questions about that? And again, yeah, the public one just calls it with the root initially just to set up the recursion where it needs to start. So again, What's the computational complexity of the search? This contains, well, it's linear again. Relative to the input size, where the input size is the number of nodes. You got a worst case scenario, you gotta look at every single node in that tree. That's all. I've seen a lot of blank faces, and I don't know if that's because you're all happy, you're lost, or what. Wow, I'm going to assume everyone understands it completely. Okay, the traversals. Well, the traversals are, here's pre-order. It's exactly the same as the pseudocode I gave you, just in Java. Current's not null. Here, what am I doing with the data? Remember how it was like access either before, pre, in between, or post? In this particular example, accessing, which is printing out the data for the sake of showing you. But accessing that current node can mean whatever you need it to be. Here, it's just printing it out just for the sake of doing something with it. Now, Pre-order, okay, post-order, pre-order traversal, pre-order, pre-order calls that. And in order traversal, but instead of printing out the contents, we're gonna add them to some other collection. So here, the accessing the node, yeah. In the pre-order, do you have to update the current? No. I'm not sure what you mean. So you check if current's not null, then you're printing the data of current. Yep. And then you're printing out the data of current dot get left. No, oh, we're not printing it out. We're calling pre-order, which oh, goes okay, here, and then okay. current becomes the left. I got it. Yeah, cool. Now here, this is an example of uh, where accessing the node, so this is an in-order traversal, not a pre-order, but this is an example of accessing the node where accessing the node means something slightly different. In this particular example, it's creating an indexed bag based on the elements in the tree, but the index bag will have the elements in the order of whatever the pre-order traversal of that tree is. So we create the index bag, call in order on the root in the sequence, return the sequence in the end. Why? Because, and what does it say? Well, it takes current, it takes the sequence, current's not null, do the in order on the left, then sequence add it, current and then do it on the right. Now this particular code, this particular example has a side effect of course because we're modifying the contents of the indexed bag sequence within this method. Now it's a private method so it's kind of hard you know what, this is actually an interesting time to talk a little bit about side effects. If we look at in order, in and of itself, it has a side effect. Because you'll notice that in order traversal doesn't return anything. But it's obviously modifying something. It's modifying something that it has reference to through the parameter. The first time this is called, the argument on line three, sequence, Sequence is a reference variable to some index list that's being modified by in order. So it's having a side effect. And just to refresh everyone's memories, 
functions, you know, we like them to have nice, clean, I'll go over here, some box. It takes some input, the argument produces some output, the return value. And we like our functions to not modify or do anything outside of this. But of course, this one has a side effect. It has one of these inputs is a reference to something somewhere else in memory. And each time it's run, it's modifying that thing. And in fact, it has no return value. Now, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with side effects, but that's where problems can arise. This is not a pure function. It has a side effect. Each time this runs, it's modifying the contents of whatever that index bay is up to. So there's a side effect there. But it's kind of funny because, you know, it's a private method, right? It's important for the inner workings of this class. And by all means, it absolutely has a side effect. It does. But often in object-oriented programming, we, we like to focus on the interface of the class. And the interface here in this context, when I say interface, it just means the public methods, let's say. The ones that you have access to. And as far as the user of this class is concerned, imagine they don't have any knowledge of any of the private methods inside, because they don't care. They don't give a shit. They just know what the public ones are, and they work. All the other internal cogs and bits and bobs that it needs in order for the public methods to do what they got to do, I don't care about. So as far as the user of this class is concerned, the one calling in order, it is a pure function. Because although the private one, yes, has a side effect, the in order method works on the implicit argument, or ex ex in implicit parameter. That's like the, the object that the method is called on. So the tree, you can think of that as like a parameter for methods. And it has a return value. And it's not modifying anything anywhere else. Because really, the private one kind of, or the public one kind of wraps. I know this marker is hard to see. Bear with me. The public method kind of like wraps that private one in it. It's hidden from me. All I see is, well, it doesn't really take any input. That's fine. And it produces output. It's that sequence in order. So it's kind of funny to think a little bit about side effects, where they are, and I don't know, just that nuance there. Yeah? If you want the extent of it having no side effects, can't you just like create a new array of like bag within the private method, then change the return type to that bag? Um, it's a little bit more, may, may, maybe you hit it. So what I would do to eliminate side effects is you can have it take a sequence, make a new, se make a new index bag, copy over the contents, and return that one. So then it doesn't have a side effect because it's not modifying the values of the parameters, then it's left alone. So there is a way to do it, but a lot of time, like you can make uh, immutable data structures, but that gets, that gets really tricky and time consuming. And it's, re it's really not that tricky, but it becomes really obvious of like, look, every time I want to modify it, I need to make a new instance, copy everything over, like everything suddenly becomes like more computationally expensive, but maybe that's okay because the pureness is valuable. 
It's an interesting observation, and there are some programming languages where, yeah, it has to be immutable. But in Java, often we'll leave them as mutable for better or worse. Now, there are immutable versions of collections in Java, but that just means that once it's created, you can't modify it, right? Now, if you want to modify it, kind of like strings, where, well, you can, you can modify it by making a new copy of it and modifying the copy before it's done. Does that answer it? Yeah. Cool. There. Any last questions before we move on to the next topic? All right. Binary search trees are a more specific type of binary trees. So we were talking about trees, then we talked about binary trees. Now we can talk about binary search trees. With binary trees, there was no particular requirement on anything other than each node has no more than two children. They're called a left and a right. That's a binary tree. A binary search tree has more constraints. So they're less general, but with those constraints comes power. Think of binary search. When we knew something about the data, we knew we could take advantage of it to increase the efficiency of a search. Because the data was sorted, I could have a better search, which is awesome course, you don't always have sorted data. So it's a special case. But when we do have that special case, we can take advantage of that information and exploit it for our benefit. This is what we're going to do with a binary search tree. It will become very obvious very quickly that binary search and binary search tree are, well, exceptionally the same idea, except now we're actually implementing it as a data structure. So the constraint we're going to have is that all val I look, I have a binary search tree, any arbitrary binary search tree. I've got the root of that tree slash subtree. And every value in my left subtree must be less than the value in the root. And every value in the right subtree must be greater than the value in the root. Now, you could allow for, pardon me, you can allow for duplicate values. This particular des description doesn't allow duplicate values. But we could easily allow duplicate values in our binary search trees by just saying either the left or the right subtree will have values that are greater than or equal to, for example. So that's what we'll do here. One could very easily make it that all well, the left subtree has all values less than or equal to the root. That's entirely fine. But for our purposes, all the values over here are going to be less than the root. All the values over here are going to be greater than or equal to the root. That's how we're going to do it. But this is a recursive definition, meaning I have a root. All values over here, I gotta do this backwards because I'm facing you. All the values over here are less than me. All values over here are greater than or equal to me. As soon as I go one step down, such that the root of the whole tree, their left subtree, I ask the question, or I have to assert that all values in its left subtree must be less than it. And all values greater than or equal to it must be in the right subtree of it. I'll show you an example of what I mean. Here are two binary, well, two binary trees. One's a binary search tree, one's not. Let's look. 
Look, we have 14. Are all values in the left subtree of 14 less than 14? Yes. Are all values in the right subtree of 14 greater than or equal to it? Yep. Let's look at 8. Are all values in 8's left subtree less than it? Are all values of 8's right subtree greater than it? Okay, here, well, we'll skip it. Here, are all the values in the left subtree of 12 less than 12? Yeah, and then the right subtree doesn't exist. Okay. 26, are all values in its left subtree less than it? Okay, great, right subtree doesn't exist. 19, all values in the right subtree, are they greater than it? Yeah. This is a binary search tree, but this one we've got a problem. Because we could do the same thing over here. Okay, seven, 7, 3, 9, and 8 are less than 10. 3 is less than 7. 9 and 8 are greater than 7. 8 is less than 9. That's all fine on the left subtree. But once we go over here, are all values in 15's left subtree less than 15? No. We've got a 16. And although it's correct in every other example, every other node's left and right subtrees and everything being less than greater than are absolutely correct, even 11 is fine. All values to the right of 11 are greater than 11. But this one breaks it, meaning it is not a binary search tree. It's just a regular old binary tree. So you gotta watch out. It's not just the root that has to have the left and right. It's all roots of all subtrees in the whole tree. Recursively all the way down. That's the rule. So here's some arbitrary binary search tree that we're gonna see a lot of, just for examples in this topic. <coughs> Notice, and this is going to be true, and we can int like intuitively reason about this. Start at the root. Go to the left, go to the left, go to the left, go to the left until you can't anymore. So look at the leftmost node in this tree. What must be true about the leftmost node in the tree? Why? Absolutely correct. By definition of the binary search tree, any value in the left subtree must be smaller than the root of that subtree. You go all the way to the left. The moment I can't take one more step to the left means there's no value less than that node. There's no value in this tree less than three. Why? Because if it's a binary search tree, if there was a number left than three, it must be to the left of three. But there is no number to the left of three, therefore it's not there. Three is the smallest value. And then what's gonna be the same if I go to the right, go to the right, go to the right, go to the right? The rightmost node, what is the rightmost node in this example? 15. 15, kinda weird to say, because you look at this 12 and you go like, yeah, but it's that, that 12 is in the left subtree of 15. You go start at the root, go all the way to the right until you can't anymore, and you're gonna find the biggest number for the exact same reason, just flip it. By binary search tree rules, if there was a number greater than 15, it must be to the right of 15. Since there is no number to the right of 15, nothing's bigger than 15 in this binary search tree. So there's an interesting property. A binary search tree is a binary tree. A binary search tree is a special case of a binary tree, therefore it has all the same operations and rules and everything of a binary tree. But there's a few additional things about a binary search tree that we need to be aware of. Obviously there's that rule which mean about the order of things. Which means if I go and add something, just like a sorted list, <coughs> If I want to add something to a sorted list, that value must be added to that sorted list, or that sorted bag, pardon me, such that that orderedness property of the sorted bag is preserved. Can't break it. We're going to have to have the same rule here. Whenever we add something to our binary search tree, it must preserve that special property of everything to the left, everything to the right. 
This actually becomes remarkably simple to implement, but we'll get there in a moment. Arguably simpler than the linear structures. Remove, same deal. We want to remove elements, but again, the way we remove something must preserve that binary search tree property. So we're left with a binary search tree. And maybe we want a couple of other uh, methods that we want to include if we're going to implement a binary search tree. I'll remove min or remove max for whatever reason. We'll see. Now, we just finished looking at a search method or a contains method, more accurately, for a general binary tree. The way it worked was, look at the root of that tree slash subtree. Is it what you're looking, does it exist? Is it what you're looking for? If it exists but it's not what you're looking for, do a search on your left subtree, do a search on your right subtree. Binary search tree is different because of this special property that we know about our data, we could be a little bit more clever. The, and that cleverness is the exact same idea that we implemented when just doing a regular old binary search. If I'm at the root and I'm looking at the number 50 and I have a binary search tree and I'm looking for the number 17, if this was a regular binary tree, I have to search the left and the right subtree, both. But this is a binary search tree. The root is 15. How, what do I have to search? Do I have to search the left and the right subtree? What do I need to look at? Just the left. Because if 17 exists in that binary search tree, it must be in the left subtree of the node that contains 50. It must. And if at any point you're saying, why must it? Because based on the definition of a binary search tree. And if you say, but what if it wasn't to the left and it was in the right? Then it's not a binary search tree. If you have a binary search tree, and you're looking at the node 50, if the number 17 exists in that binary search tree, it might not, but if it does exist, it must be in the left subtree because 17 is less than 50. If I was looking for 51, it must be in the right subtree. I could search it naively with the exact same contains method I just wrote, and it'll work. And the computational complexity is going to be linear. Because worst case scenario, I have to put my finger on each one of those things. But with a binary search, it's a little bit better. Because I'm looking at 14. Do I have an example? Yeah. I'm looking at 14. When you're looking at this tree, Let's say I'm looking for the number 23, right? 23 is in there. We have a full view of this thing. But how many nodes, because look, okay, I look at 14. Is 14 23? No. But 23 is bigger than 14, so it must be in the right subtree. So we're going to do this search again, but on the right subtree. 26, are you 23? No, but 23 is less than 26, so it must be in the left subtree. So we ask the left subtree. 19, are you 23? No, but 23 is bigger, so it must be in the right subtree. Hey, 23, are you 23? Yes. Great. What is the maximum distance? How many things do I have to look at in this example? Four. One, two, three, four. What's the height of this tree? Four. 
Actually, yeah, I guess it's three because we go by the level. It's zero, one, two, three. Path length of three, fine. But you'll notice that the worst case scenario of a binary search on a binary search tree will traverse all the way down until we get to a leap. And the worst case scenario is the leap that's the furthest away from the root. That's the worst case scenario. And that's going to be related to the height of the tree. And you'll notice, or if you don't, if you didn't notice, or if we already talked about it, if you just need a refresher, what's the relationship between the number of nodes in a binary tree and the height of a binary tree? You don't even need to be very precise. You could just give me a, eh, it's like this. Two to the n. Well, it's the, actually it's the opposite of it based on how I asked the question. The height of the tree, if I want to know the number of nodes in a tree roughly, in a binary tree, based on the height, it's two to the n where n is the height. But here I've got the number of nodes, let's say. So what's the relationship between the number of nodes and the height? What's the opposite of 2 to the n? Log n. Anyone be more specific? Log base 2 of n. Yeah. Oh, how many times? I have to remind you, those are inverses. One just undoes the other. So there's that relationship there. And we can start to intuitively see why is there that logarithmic relationship? Well, look, we can relate the height of the tree the number of the nodes in the tree. Now this isn't what we call a full binary tree or a complete. I, I always get them mixed up. We could have a binary tree. full tree there, right? It's perfectly balanced. Every level is completely full. If I wanted to add another node to this tree, I have to just, you know, if I'm going left to right, I'd have to go here, right? Let's ignore that. So here's an idealized situation. I've got a lot of nodes in that tree. How many? Well, I've got 16 plus 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1. That should be 31 nodes. 31 nodes. But when doing a binary search here, you look concerned about 31. You made a face. Can you do 32 or am I just... Well, it's 16. Let me put it this way. So this is 8. Oh, it's 15 plus. Yeah, 15 okay. plus, no. yeah, I know. I know, because you're thinking, okay. shouldn't it be double? But it's, not, it's minus it's one. one. It's a whole okay. thing. Yeah. If I was doing a search through this, and it wasn't a binary search tree, it could be anywhere. I might have to go all the way down here, and then backtrack, and then backtrack more. Right? And play that game. But because of the binary search tree, I never need to backtrack. Ever. The furthest I'm ever going to have to go 
is all the way down to a leaf. I can't go any deeper. Let's say, okay, I've got 50, 30, 25, 25, since we allow duplicates, 24, 25, uh, 11, 10, 19. I'm just going to fill out the left subtree just for fun. 40, 42, 41, 48, 42, no, 38, 39, no, my God, where's my brain? 37, 39, great. I'm only going to do that side. Well, look, let's say I'm looking for the number 49. 49 doesn't exist in here, okay? 50. Now let's say I'm looking for 47 actually, to make it let more obvious that it has nothing to do with being on the edge. 47. Is 50 47? No. Great. So I go here. All of these nodes are now useless to me in this search. I don't care. I'm never going to need to look over there for 47. Ever. 30. Which side is it? That side, right? So I never need to look over here, and I never will for 37. 47, what, did I, what am I looking for? 47. 37, 47. 47. Yeah, I agree, one of them. 40, which side is it? To the right, so it's not here. I'm just gonna make sure this doesn't go to sleep, because that'll be annoying. Almost. So it must be over here. 47 must be on this side. So look, I'm looking at 48. If 47 is in this tree, it must be to the left of, 30, of 48. It must be. Because I just concluded that it must be to the right of 42. It must be to the left of 48. But, the, but it's not there. And it can never be in any other subtree. There's no need to backtrack. Backtracking is wasting time. It's not there. It doesn't exist. The furthest I will ever need to travel when doing a binary search is the length or the height of the tree. Worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is I get to a leaf node and that leaf node is the one furthest away from the root. That's the worst case scenario. And that's why that relationship. So remember when we talked about the computation complexity of binary search, it wasn't linear, it was log base two of n. The number of nodes in a tree, a binary tree, and the height have that relationship. Log base two of n, or two to the n, depending on which way you're looking at it. The number of nodes, let's say we have a, a, a tree with n nodes and height h. The number of nodes, n, is going to be related to the height through a 2 to the h relationship. The number, the height of a tree based on the number of nodes n is going to be related to the height through a logarithmic relationship. Just which way are we going, right? That's all. So, let's look at a binary search. Why is count included here? I don't think it's supposed to be. Let's deal with that later. So, is current null, yes or no? If it is, well, it doesn't exist. Then what am I doing? Well, if you remember back to a sorted bag, 
we're using this compare to thing. This is a binary search tree. The elements in it must have some predefined order such that they can be sorted. So if I say this is a tree of car parts, you have to ask like, well, what's the ordering? How do I know where it goes where? And that would be defined with a comparable thing, right? So we know that the elements of type T are comparable because they would need to be in order to be in a binary search tree. So we can compare them. And remember, when one element is less than the other, we get a negative value. If they're equal, we get a zero value. And if the other one's greater, we get a positive value. So that's what I'm getting in comparison, just to take it out so the lines of code don't get too bulky. So we have this comparison. The comparison is either zero, if they're equal, negative one, or positive one. So I ask, if comparison is zero, well, we found it. We're done. We don't need to search the left or right subtree. So that's another base case. Otherwise, if comparison is greater than zero, we do the search on the left subtree. Otherwise, you do it on the right subtree. But the difference here is, if we look at this one, it calls it on the left and the right. Sure, we have the sort circuited or, meaning if we find it on the left, there's no need to call it on the right. But this might call contains twice. One call that contains can call contains twice. In the binary search, you can never call binary search twice, ever. It'll only ever get called once with each call to binary search. Huge difference. And that's, you know, where the special, the, 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 the fancy stuff is. Anyways, we'll end here.